Welcome to Watching Silent Films. This is Yifang, and with me are my co-host Lily, and I guess Adam. You can be our co-host. <laughs> Hello there. Hello. How are you? Greetings, greetings. Uh, today we're gonna what we do on this podcast we watch uh, a film or a series of shorts on silent in the silent era. We talk about it. That's pretty much all we do. And uh, today we're gonna talk about The Wind, the Victor Seastrom or Stroheim, however you pronounce his last name. Uh, in 1928. Uh, before we get on there, have you guys watched anything in the classic realm? You don't have to. Just uh, throwing it out there. <coughs> Excuse me. If you guys had um, a chance. Well, not in the classic realm, but I did watch a short film uh, that was featured on YouTube for some reason, probably because it was by a Coppola in there. <laughs> but um, it was called Daddy. It features Dylan Sprouse and Ron Rifkin. It was uh, under it was about 18 minutes, but it was very interesting. Um, Dylan Sprouse is a, an escort, essentially, and basically Ron Rifkin's character is an elderly man who lost his wife. So I, he's kind of just trying to live it up at the very end. But it's very poignant, they say on the internet with all the comments, that the, it's the idea that Dylan's character is deaf and he's giving Ron Rifkin's character the last hurrah. So it was very interesting. Good hmm. cinematography. Um, Dylan Sprouse is gorgeous, so throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I liked it for a short. Sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if he's related to any of the other couple of us. No, that's, that's right. So wondering. he is a distant relative of Francis. I was like, "There's, I mean, there's got to be. It, it can't be a coincidence to have that last name and not be related to Francis Ford." But he is a distant right. relative. Yeah, he's Looks younger like. than I am, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, he's a distant relative, of Francis Gofar. <laughs> well, it makes sense. <laughs> I Most mean, people in the in a entertainment business they keep it within. Yeah, there's a ne- nepotism, right? Yeah. It's been going on forever. Of course. Look at the Barrymores. That's right. Was that it for you? Or, I mean, Lily? Yeah, I mean, that was the only film that I've recently watched. Unfortunately, not in the classics, but it yeah. was a film. I, it's very hard for me to watch films, as we've quite frequently discussed, <laughs> unless it's for the podcast, but... I was happy to actually watch this one because I I do a lot of film work, so I always enjoy seeing the release and then imagining what they were exactly doing behind the scenes since I usually work that area. Yeah, you don't nice. you didn't work on this one, right? No. That yeah. would have been cool though. Yeah. But just like shot choices and understanding why the director of photography is doing certain lighting the way it is, like the costume designer, what that really means even like who they choose for their characters even if it's a short role uh, obviously their presence means something in the audition room so right. that part is like what intrigues me the most because i know Dil- the cole cole and dylan sprouse growing up from like the sweet life of zach and cody that stupid show on disney channel <laughs> but mm-hmm. now that they're older uh they're finally kind of branching out to different roles like, his brother does that Riverdale show, which is based on the Archie Bunker comics, where Dylan's okay. kind of more, I don't, well, this is the only film I know that he's done, but they're kind of just doing different things from cutesy, fun Disney stuff. They seem to be into darker, edgier roles, and I, I, can, dig, I can dig that. So what'd you say the title was? Just Daddy. Daddy. You can probably oh. Google uh, that with Coppola, and you'll probably hit it. It's mm-hmm. It's probably only one short movie with uh, those combinations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'll check it out. Yeah. I'm always looking for something. Uh, well, I saw a couple. Um, the first one was Theater of Blood, 1973. Uh, that was with Vincent Price and Dinah Rigg, Ian Hendry. Uh, Dinah Rigg and... Uh, Vincent Price said that that was their favorite film that they did. Um, it was just a. Uh, it was Dinah Rigg was known for the Avengers, which is not the comic but the show in England. 
Um, it was uh, kind of a spoof on James Bond. Ian Hendry actually started it off, so it was fun to see both of them in the same film since they were both in the Avengers. Um, basically, it's a Shakespearean actor that takes poetic revenge on the critics who denied him recognition. So he thought he... Um, everyone thought that he had killed himself by leaping off of um, uh, out of a window in a building. But there was a shelter where uh, addicts and homeless people in general took him in and nursed him to health. And basically between him and his daughter, they just um, started killing people uh, one by one, done the same way that certain Shakespeare plays would be uh, done. Uh, so uh, I, The Avengers has always been uh, one of my favorite shows growing up. Um, and it's basically... You know, people are getting killed, but you never take it seriously because it's not done seriously. And they always had creative uh, camera angles or sometimes they used a fisheye lens for, you know, a seemingly boring scene, you know, where someone's just walking from A to B, but they still make it look interesting. Uh, there was one murder where a critic was forced uh, to eat his two beloved dogs because it was baked in a pie and he didn't realize it was his uh, prized dogs inside. So that was his uh, comeuppance. And then uh, somehow they killed him that way. Um, I forgot. I don't remember how they actually got. They must. Have, oh, I know what they did. They put a funnel on his mouth and just kept feeding him the food until he uh, basically died. Uh, there was another one uh, where he posed as a hairdresser uh, and the woman critic was coming in to have her hair done, but she got electrocuted by the hair rollers. Uh there was a lot of blood in this, but it was so bright red that it was obviously paint. Hmm. Well, I'm sure it's also not as gory as modern horror. It's probably oh no, it it was a it was like Monty Python right gore. You know, right. it just <laughs> but it's not you like could... you know like the 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 torture porn that modern saw. No, no, nothing like that. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, Although they would cut off someone's head and place it next to the woman, so when she woke up, her husband's head was uh, oh would roll off the body. That's what that's what it was. Um, the other one I watched was a Japanese film, uh, Yusajura uh, Uzo, in 1959. He was like the master of the mundane. Uh, he just all of his films are really really slow. Uh, and you're basically watching it because each scene is set up like a photograph or a painting. And it's it's always the relationship between, um, you know, older and younger, um, you know, just different groups of people and how they treat each other. And it kind of it's just like it's just like watching a painting turn into a movie where you just you're just watching um, the movie for that reason. And that's it. So which which Ozu did you watch again? It's called the Floating Weeds. It's um, ah, in color. Yes, I think so it's we, like the third color. Yeah, we recommended one a few months ago. I can't remember. Uh, Tokyo called, Story. That or Late Spring. It's probably Late Spring, nineteen forty. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, he's an amazing director. So he's. Uh, yeah. Most people, I think, can name probably potentially if they're a film nerd, uh, Akira Kurosawa. I would say. Oh yeah. Uh, um, but. Uh, when you get into Ozu, that's kind of deeper cuts a little bit of Japanese. They're cinema. polar opposites, him and uh, Kurosawa. Yeah, but uh, then Kurosawa's all about action. Ozu isn't. Right, exactly. But I, I think both are very much about character, which is uh, yeah, why oh, yeah. they've had had great success uh, over the years. Well, this one he... is about a head of a Japanese theater troupe that returns to a small coastal town. Where he left, uh, he went to visit his uh, old girlfriend who had a son by him, but he just tells the son that he's the uncle. Right. Uh, meanwhile, his mistress grows jealous, and they go they go from there. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing that he does. It's very much about like fam family r relationships and conflicts. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd say majority of his filmography is like yep. that. He has done a, a series of silent films. That I'm not sure. Yep. What kind of, In the of, 30s availabilities exist uh, uh they're all on criterion there's quite a few yeah yeah and some of them are co comedic uh yeah. their silent films lasted through the 30s uh 50s oh 50s. up that high yeah i know um italy did but i didn't think um huh well many cause... of the countries outside the u.s had silent films through 
the 30s and 40s. It depends on which country. Oh, no, no, no. Italy used silent equipment and then dubbed afterwards. That's what their thing was. Right. But Japanese... That's why the voices uh, never went. Would, would, ...would have gone longer because they used to have... Oh, man, I'm going to forget the term now. But there's this uh, uh, person who would describe using a microphone while the film is playing, describe what's on screen and oh, culturally yeah, yeah. translate what's going on on screen. And uh, I'm going to figure out this term. Japanese silent film narrator. <laughs> yeah, Benshi. That's what it's called. Benshi. So Benshi thought... is the term that yeah. is provided for a type of role. It's a job. Uh, mm hmm at some point, there was like hundreds, if not thousands of these people uh, during the height of these uh, silent film era. And they used to uh, basically narrate when uh, the films would be Im imported into Japan. They would not just do a direct translation of the dialogue, uh, the Western films, but they actually explain to the culture why Americans were doing things that are totally opposite of their own culture, you know? Right. So that's like one part of what they did. And even after the uh, Western cinema ended uh, the uh, exports and they stopped making them, they converted to talkies, Japanese continue to have uh, the silence. Uh, I mean, they started talkies as well. So it's not just. Uh, yeah, because I think there were some in the 40s by Uzo. In the 40s. Exactly, yeah. So it, would, it was parallel, but uh, it was still right. tremendously popular well into the, the 40s because huh. it became an art form unto itself. And Oh, yeah. In Japan, like a lot of these ancient cultures, they love to hold on to old things <laughs> until it's totally exhausted. Anyways, hmm. uh, all right, go on. Did you, did you have anything else? Uh, nope, that's it. I had a chance to uh, check out... What did I check out? Um, I don't think I quite finished it, but I started um, the. Uh, I'm forgetting the title now. I'm getting very forgetful today. I think it was uh, uh -huh. the Lou Lon Chaney uh, Notre Dame movie. I think I started oh, okay. it a little bit. I don't think I made much of it, but it was a really good, good kickoff. It's uh, a lot of these uh, great classics of. The, the silent era really does feel like it was made just in recent time, just like the one we're going to talk about. It really doesn't feel like they they were made, yeah. you know, uh, almost 100 years ago. It's quite amazing. Well, the top directors copied a lot of what they saw. Of course, of course. Scorsese loves uh, silent. Yeah. With that, let's get into it. So, The Wind, 1928. Uh, one of the last silent films uh yeah. ever made i think um in the era of time uh especially by uh victor seastrom the swedish director uh-huh um the plot would be how do i how would I describe the plot the plot is um there would be this uh, there's this character letty she is a virginian right who mm -hmm. seems like she uh you know didn't have anything or lost everything and moved to somewhere in midwest maybe west somewhere in and... texas Sweet well that's what texas. the novel took that's the novel but we don't know for sure what what oh, okay. uh, state they actually said in the movie but the, uh, you know, so she moved to rejoin uh, her cousin. What was her cousin's name? Uh, Beverly. Beverly, that's right. That's right. Which apparently is uh, a male name, at least it was popular back then. Probably less so today. <laughs> but yeah. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so she, uh, you know, it, it to live with her cousin to kind of just, I guess, live, continue to live her life. And, uh, Little does she know the 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 win in this part of the country is so tremendous that uh, it would kind of uh, overtake and overwhelm many parts of her life, and you know she's very much uh, um, had the good life and now kind of uh, getting confronted with the realities of frontier life and it's a completely different lifestyle than what she's used to, and kind of that's the conflict of that, but also just. Uh, 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 various different uh, 
antagonists along the way uh where you know there are people who are trying to marry her and or uh swindle her and and stuff like that so that's kind of the plot general plot line and we can get into more detail as we go along uh lily yeah. what'd you think of this film oh i thought it was excellent i'm glad you know we finally got a chance to watch it because it does feel so modern for being a silent film even though it was at the beginning of the talkies um oh i don't know it was just the acting was really good i liked how you know it's just the basis of the stories that like we said this girl has nothing she goes from nowhere to nowhere but she's trying to get somewhere and i feel like well that's relatable to everybody (laughs) um even though it was hard to see you being that it was black and white, you could tell what they were trying to accomplish with their cinematography. Um, you know, you get all those landscapes whenever you can, uh, showing the house being buried in granules of sand. Like, it was insane. Because uh, we watched the ending, or the beginning, with Lily and Gish talking about being filmed in, I believe she said the Mojave Desert, and what they had to do to get the wind to kick up like that. So just learning all those details made this movie a little more fascinating to me. Um, Because really, I don't know too many movies that use sand anymore. I mean, the most recent one was the reboot of Mad Max, which was actually really good. I have seen that one. (laughs) I've seen that movie all the way through. (laughs) It was excellent. Um, But yeah, I feel like it's kind of like an avoidable earth substance if you can get away with it, unless you're at the beach. So I liked how they vitalized that gritty, you know, uh, abrasive effect to the film because it kind of does rub off on all the characters in that respect. Everybody is a little gritty. Everyone is a little abrasive. Besides Beverly, who actually seems pretty chill. And then Lillian Gish does (laughs) get, you know, slowly more rough because she has to be in order to survive. So that was my take on it. Um, Yeah, I've been wanting to see this movie for so long, and I'm so happy we did. But I will say, I thought, um, from seeing other clips of other movies she's been in, I thought, uh, there's this one scene where she's, like, crying and screaming in a closet. Oh, yeah. Do you, I don't know, maybe you guys know what film that was, but I actually thought that she was doing that in the wind. I but, think that's Broken Blossoms. Oh, yep, that's actually right. That's Broken Blossoms, because I know she's supposed to be a child in it. Yeah, 12. Yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what was this one? What was it? <laughs> yeah. What did you think of it, Adam? Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you were winding up. Um, when you originally asked uh, for us to watch this, I had it confused with uh, A Romance of the Redwoods with Mary Pickford. And that's what I had in my head. I watched that at the festival. Um, uh, that's the one where she was having a run in with DeMille. So I had the completely different movie, but in some ways it was similar. Uh, but anyway, she, um, I, I had watched um, The Scarlet Letter before. And so she, uh, Lillian was in charge of putting this movie together. I guess the one who usually runs things was overworked. So he would always hand it off to her because she knows what she's doing. So she picked the same director, Victor Schoenstrom. Yeah, Louis B. Mayer, who was yep. the studio head, MGM, I think. Uh, did she say a different name? Because it was that clip you gave us. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that. I think it's, it's that guy. It's, it's okay, Mayer, could yeah. be. Um, and um, I just thought the, the lead, um, Lars Hansen, he was a, a very good choice. Uh, you know, he, he had the leading man looks, but then again, he was, he was able to uh, do subtle acting. When it came to uh, the wedding night, uh, the changes he went through just like right in front of us uh, was really, really subtle. I don't know how much directing that took or if he just knew his way already. Because, I mean, they're supposed to be a much younger couple, but she was like 33. He was about 40. Um, But they were playing, I'm guessing, early. Maybe she could have been even like 18, 19. Um, But the acting, I just thought in general, was amazing. Um, There were only two females and the other... um, actress was um you knew what she was about immediately uh you didn't have to guess what she was feeling uh here she was 
acting masculine while this dainty thing comes in from the East Coast, uh, not knowing, you know, how to be out there and how to survive. Uh, the thing that really got me in general was I couldn't understand why anybody would want to settle in a place that had that much wind. I mean, why would you? But then the more I read of different people uh, who wrote different things about it, they were saying a lot of it was in her own head. Uh, she was used to Virginia. So when she's seeing this, um, you know, you're seeing it through her eyes where she's imagining kind of some of it. Uh, I mean, they do have rough winds, but I don't think it was as much as um, we were seeing her picture. Um, I always loved miniatures. Uh, when the rain, uh, when the train was coming through, um, I just, I just really enjoy, the, you know, the artistry they had in putting something like that together. Yeah, just like um, that mansion. <laughs> yeah, what was that movie we just watched last um, week? Uh, castle, haunted castle. Haunted castle. Yes, the haunted yeah. castle. Get very <laughs> forgetful. The haunted so, castle at the mansion. Yes. I so always like zoom I in saying, on something like that. Yeah, it's pretty much very common. I think all yeah, these films, yeah. they've, they've had to use that for exterior. But I've said why. It's because I grew up watching those puppet shows. So to me, that that's what I kind of zoom in on. Right. Um, let's see. Just I, I just thought I love the contrast where um, she was still living with her cousin. And she was ironing her, her outfits. Meanwhile, uh, the wife is basically gutting a cow in the same room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the apron and everything. And... When she was being approached by two different men, I just love the way the wife says, well, you're going to have to pick one of them because you're not staying with us anymore. Mm. Uh, the, the, her husband, he really seemed to be a background character. I mean, he was he was the linchpin, but then again, he wasn't. Um, uh, the way um, the comic relief, uh, Sourdough and Lige uh, had to compete for the same woman, and it was obvious to everyone watching that Lige would win. Uh, but they had to do a shooting contest. Uh, I love the cyclone that was coming at them. It was like a prototype to um, Wizard of Oz. Um, yeah, uh, it's just, uh, I guess the story ended differently in the book uh, where she, uh, she went crazy and just ran out and died that way. But uh, it was a kind of an argument whether uh, it was changed for the movie later on or if it was done up front. Um, it's, it's still confusing to me on when it was done. But I, I seemed to—I I thought it was um, the way the characters was built up and where the scenes built up that it ended the way you know that was you know doable, and that's it. Alrighty, Fong, your take. <laughs> would you would you rate that as one of the greatest silent films ever made, or? Uh, yeah, that along with the man who laughs, <laughs> I liked both. The man there was, you mean? The man, no, no, the man who laughs. Oh, right, that the okay, yeah, that's the, or the one. yeah, that's the right title, isn't it? That's right, because yeah. because Victor Schroesrum also made another movie called I Man There It Was, which was a short, yeah, like a forty minute or something. Yeah, was that the one where he was near the uh, the ocean? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw that and the one that was uh, done right afterwards, uh, Allah and his wife. Yes. So he and I think you mentioned it before, and I was confusing the two. <laughs> yeah. So that that particular film, which is a uh, uh, adaptation of the uh, Ibsen uh, work, but the the net sum is that he loves to utilize um, nature, nature to yeah. symbolize or maybe perhaps uh, add to. I mean, the wind is obviously a character in this movie. Oh yeah, which back then was probably. Uh, I don't know. Befuddling is the right word, but just kind of confusing to a lot of audiences. I'm not oh, yeah. sure that they were quite ready for things like this. Uh, but nowadays we've seen so many movies and it's like, yeah, it, you know, it's very common, I think, in, in, in many ways. Uh, I like the way she did the dishes. Yeah. She was yeah. washing it in sand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. just like his uh, man there was, it, nature essentially is, uh, you know, is one of the characters that's just grating. And like you guys had mentioned, is something that was, it is one of the, uh, foremost antagonist uh in this film it's you know it's uh you know it's the whole notion that there's only like seven stories or basic plots you know man versus yeah. man, man versus nature man versus um you know whatever there is and so boy gets girl 
Yeah, but it usually has a man something versus something in there. There's like man versus machine, man versus nature, man versus God, man versus et cetera, et cetera. It, it goes down the list, but right. Um, I, I, you know, so I, I don't think I've ever seen this one because you know, huh. si- since the early two thousands, uh, that's when I did most of my silent film watching. There have been many, many, many releases of silent films, and. Uh, you know, I I obviously didn't watch all of them even back then that was available to me, but I think that I was able to get to what I could have at that time. And this is one of those titles that, uh, you know, it wasn't on DVD, and I don't know, uh, I don't know when the VHS came out, and I just didn't really seek after it. I think I was trying to get what was most convenient, which was on DVD, and most of the VHS ones I didn't really seek after. <laughs> so this is right. one of those titles that. Probably were you know was released on VHS in in eighties or nineties, but I didn't really you know uh, chased after it and looked looked for it. But I will say that my preconception of this film, I was thinking in my mind something more along the lines of um, I don't know if there's a movie like this, but I was in my mind, I was when I heard of the film. I was just thinking that it's a uh, uh, a movie where Ilan Gish has to move somewhere in the Dust Bowl area with all these type of weather conditions, and she's kind of like, "Have you guys uh, heard of our uh, John, uh, John Steinbeck, uh, The Grapes of Wrath?" You guys? Oh yeah, oh yeah, never read it. Yeah, yeah but you it. you get the I read story right? You get the story, the film. There's yep. a bunch of there's a movie too. I, I think, yeah, uh, I have oh, seen yeah. the film in eighth grade. <laughs> Right, so at least you know the storyline. the The point of the storyline is that you know everybody has, has a hard life and they got to make it. I mean, that's very yeah. high level. There's a lot more to the movie, but in the in the book. But I think I was thinking more like that, but uh, repackaged as a Lillian Gish vehicle, where she's this one ma- woman uh, person. She moves out in the middle of nowhere and and yeah, kind it's of is like not striking a bell. Yeah, and, and and like her against. And I've seen a lot of her stuff too. Right, right. So I was thinking, I was more thinking that this is a movie like that, like, like she's she's like you know trying to grow something uh-huh. and be a farmer. And so when oh, I so think, she was tougher in that one then. No, no, no. I was thinking that the wind is a movie about that. I was thinking right, more, right. But that movie sounds like she'd be more tough. Where this, where the wind, she wasn't. She was. That's um, that's that's exactly my point. Is she like, was I blown was, away literally. Right. <laughs> well, I was thinking that she would move out there. She didn't know what she was getting to, but she was like, oh yeah, committed to the life. That was the movie that I was imagining in my head when I, when I first heard of the wind oh, okay. over the years. Are you sure that wasn't in the sixties? Um, the one you just mentioned. Because that sounds like I hadn't seen it, but it sounds like what I, a synopsis I read. Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. If you and, can find it. Uh, yeah, because uh, I read uh, D.W. Griffith and me, and when she wrote that book, she was doing that movie. And that's the only reason why I knew about it. Yeah, if you can find um, that movie. I, I, I don't yeah, know. I, I don't think I've seen IMDb. all her movies. So I, I can't claim that I've seen all her movies because she made a huge, you know, crap load of movies. But um. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so I was thinking that that was going to be the plot of this film because, you know, if you think about her story career, I really think that she does push a lot of those uh, agendas of like the women's rights and having very fem- strong female characters in spite of the circumstances and stuff like that. You know, I-, I think she does try to push for that. It doesn't always come through, but I know that, uh, you know, she's like one of the... Uh, best actresses of the silent era you know and she's built up some power and even at especially around the late 80s oh yeah 20 sorry 1920s and she's capable of pushing some of these storylines through anyways the point was uh, that's warning, what i was thinking and warning um, shot, maybe how's that warning shot i'm just looking through the imdb during a stick oh no that's not it yeah sorry <laughs> and even like i think even like the the previous efforts like you saw scarlet Later, and I feel like there's a lot more stronger the female versus a lot more rounded character with inner life with sort of uh-huh. gumption and stuff like that. But I had no idea that because I never read the novel and I hadn't seen the movie. But I know that the the film was actually about a dainty sort of uh, person that was in a, a better economic class, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, 
her providers, her parents just died or something. Yeah. But this is according to the novel. We don't really get that context in the film itself, but the, the novel paints it that way. And that uh, she basically had to go to her surviving relative to survive. Right. And so um, we'll put this uh, link. We'll put a couple of these links in the show notes. But there is uh, uh, like somebody, I, I can't remember the name now, but there's somebody wrote a, like a college paper on that. Now, I sent it around. I don't know if you guys yeah. had a chance to read it. But uh, oh, yeah. he did some analysis oh, yeah. on it. And then, then there's another one by uh, Fritzy, uh Movie Silently, who did an analysis of sort of the three uh, myths or misconceptions about the win, right? Mm-hmm. And so the th- three of them was that, you know, MGM slapped on a happy ending. Well, it was never shot. So if the ending was never shot, it couldn't have existed. Right. So that's the records. She went to primary research and figured it out, and that was great. Um, that's a great site, by the way. Movie silently. Highly recommend it. And uh, the second myth is that the tragic ending still exists somewhere in Europe, some print somewhere, and that can't happen again. It, the print never existed. <laughs> So it's just, yeah. you know, it's hard to dispute this, but sometimes uh, with the MGM intro, not MGM, what's it called? Uh, TCM restoration, uh, when they right, re-showed right, right. it on cable TV, she had to do a, a couple of minutes intro. I, I, she's either misremembering things or have their own perspective. You know, that's what happens over the years is that sometimes these Hollywood legends will have their way of remembering things and how they try to remember that. She's detail. done so much. So yeah. to even remember you know something that far back right exactly and that's not just her but like a big chunk of the original stars in fact if you uh and i probably mentioned this on this podcast before but many 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 of the greats like the douglas fairbanks like the um uh raul walsh or like these famous famous directors and stars they don't they view media as something to play and toy with they don't like view it as something where uh they're actual truth tellers they they just view it as another uh, money maker that's kind of using right. them then they are the product so even back then they feel like in a social media sense that they know that they are the product and so they would never mm-hmm. tell like them the real story I mean they would like have things they would say that they would make up stories you know in the news media and so when you say it long enough you start believing it you know so yeah, the um, more and I so, watch like, Lillian the more I have respect for her I've yeah. seen her in some 50s films too right right so the point is, um, she may not have remembered all these things the way that the records you know, were. And it wasn't shot in uh, Mojave Desert. It was shot in uh, San Joaquin Valley, which is about, I just Google mapped it. It's about eight hours away. So it's not even nowhere near Mojave Desert. Right? Oh, whoops. And the max high was like 105 or 80s or 90s. It's really not 120 degrees. So there's a lot of like myths built around these things. Having said that, I, it was still, I think... You know that doesn't detract from it, but what what is interesting is the way that uh, Fritzi compared the the plot lines of both the novel and the book. Uh, mm-hmm. The novel, the first half of the movie, generally is on point with the novel, but then the second uh, half is where it deviates. Specifically, the the plot where in the in the book itself, uh, the wife that Letty does not tell uh, the husband Liege that uh, she doesn't love him. So he doesn't know. He she she just kind of pretends that everything's normal. Right. So that's the difference. And then she basically, the reveal that uh, she's not in love with him is at the end. That's the climax of the film, and leaves the main character still distraught that he went out and he basically either never comes back or doesn't come back for a long time. And the very very end of the film, she actually, after the whole, uh, what's the other character? Uh, Roddy, it, when yeah, Roddy, Roddy comes back, uh, you know, and she kills him, she actually go, runs out into the desert and just presumably die, dies, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the the husband leaves doesn't come back. So that's the plot of the the book, um, and in in the in the plot of the the film, they have to change a lot of that dramatically because in the book, uh, the narrative is taking like, a, um. Adam says inside of her head. So in the book, uh-huh. in the novel, you, you have the luxury of time and you have luxury of words and chapters and things, sentences, and you can build all these things by, you know, digging into a person's br- perspective in psyche okay. in psyche and writing what's going on internally. And so that's, I think one of the things that I mentioned was that 
potentially the second half of the film could potentially all be inside of her head of just the struggle against the wind and and stuff like that and yeah uh, i just couldn't see anyone settling in a place that did that right, forever right, right so but anyway so that's kind of the difference is within the plot because in in the film she no- lets him know right away because I think part of the narrative is that you you got to have tension, right? That's the beauty of films right. is that you got to always build that tension. And with that tension right then and there, that allows, uh, you know, the the way it plays out towards the end where then she conquers her fears, as it were. Right. Well, I love the uh, back at the wedding night, the uh, shots of the feet just pa- pa- oh, uh, yes. pacing back that and forth. That was a good one. Yeah. yeah. But. But even before that happened, just the look on his face, you know, Lars right. Hansen, he was so good. He's done a lot you know, of other stuff. I haven't. Yeah. I don't remember if I've seen it. I may have. I can't remember. Well, I've only <laughs> seen him in uh, the Scarlet Letter. Um, right. So they, they they reunited for this, I think. So. Right. Well, she she basically called him out. <laughs> right. She was in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's the beautiful thing about this film is, uh, I think all of the different ways that it represents different things uh like uh lily just said you, you know you talk about the how everybody is abrasive like the grain of sand and also how i think the sand is a uh a character on and so i think i just think that the character is my own personal interpretation i don't know if i read it anywhere but it's uh um, well, what about the horse yeah. oh of course the horse but i'm talking yeah. about just the the sand and the storm and right the wind. right i feel like that is like epitomized through the Roddy character. I feel like mm, okay. in the train, when we first meet up with uh, Letty's character, uh, you know, we don't see the, the wind at all, but it's right after meeting Roddy on the train that the wind really shows up. And I feel like it's personified the wind. Yes. But also the wind and Roddy basically are one and the same. And Roddy is a okay. human form of the wind, I think. And so, you know, and every time point. she, every time Roddy comes and tries to approach Letty, it's always about can you survive the wind? Can you, hmm. right from the get go, it's like it's gonna wear down. You're gonna go crazy, and you know, and and she even, I mean, he if, with everything, he's trying to get her away from this place, just like the wind so he, is. He brought the tornado then. <laughs> right, right. That's mm. that's kind of the thing is that he's synonymous with this whole uh, weather symbolizing. Yeah. A force that is trying the force to... of nature against an immovable object, yeah, something like that, <laughs> yeah. So I feel like there's a, a definitely some uh, uh, ties, I think, from a character perspective that they have, uh, uh-huh. which is brilliant because the screenwriter, you know, that adapted this. So the novel's written by a woman, and the f- screenwriter is female, and the producer essentially is a link, which is female, and the stars are female. Yeah. It's like I love all of this, you know. Um, Anyway, so I, I, that's like my take on that specific thing. But I thought I also thought that the actual lighting was really well done, especially yes. when the light went out and she has to light a a, uh, a lamp or something or a lantern and uh-huh. kind of move that yeah. around the room in the dark. Uh, uh, I mean, all of that is just brilliant. The, 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 the cynematography, the camera work, what it they were symbolizes. lucky they didn't get blinded, right? You know, the actors, because. Uh, right. Uh, I, and the special they show every, all the people behind the cameras wearing goggles. Right, right. But but these people had to be in front of the sand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So everything about it, I just really enjoy and 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 and, and you know remember that a, a lot of this uh, nature is a uh, a character in the film is actually something that uh, F. W. Myrna also adapts yeah. too because it's highly influential. He really enjoyed. Victor C. Strom's uh, work, and so it, it is. It does rear its head in his film as well. Uh, what do you think of the music? The music is Carl Davis, is w- which is one of the greatest, uh, I think, accompanists of our uh-huh. time, at least modern times, uh, for silent films. So I enjoy it. I didn't see the other version. There's been two, possibly oh. more versions. The version that we saw is the TCM restoration, which did right. uh, uh, commission uh carl davis to write it mm-hmm. but but there is another version i feel like some people like the other version i i don't know i haven't seen the other or watched the i don't remember it now because i watched it previously on um criterion and i don't remember if the music was any different or if they used the same one 
Yeah. Uh, well, I really don't know. Are you talking about the wind? Yep. I, I don't think the wind's not on DVD yet. It's it's just been on No, it was on Criterion. I belonged to the channel. And they had it and they took it away. Oh, you mean the wind? Uh, so I, right. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. caught it just before it ran its course and the huh? license ran out. So, um, yeah, that's I had cool. watched it before and then I watched this version. I, I honestly don't remember if the music was any different. But I know the wind sound effect was obviously there. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's why I saw it. Uh, I thought it seemed, well, about the same quality as what you showed me. But um, I, I, it's been a, a two months since I've seen it. Yeah. So, but um, I just thought, you know, music makes the movie for me. Yeah, well, music is tough with the Sonic era because uh, there's, you know, uh, some film composers who've done some historic research says, uh, on one hand, you have people who've done some research and they're like, majority of the greatest silent films, they all have original music and score written. Mm-hmm. And then some are like, well, you know, you can kind of just play it by ear. Just because right. once it lands at the specific venue that the film plays, the accompanist doesn't always go with the original music, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's a different attitudes about original scores and music for films. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, like I said, it was on Criterion, so I got to see it. Uh, this is my second time around. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I was going to make another comment about the, whoops, what were go you going to say? No, go what ahead. were you going to say? <laughs> um, I was just going to make another comment about how good the music was with this. At least for me, this is how I saw it. So like when the part Letty is attacked by Cora, that's Beverly's wife. Uh huh. It's just, I really... My note was just to myself was that I love how you can hear the hiss and the rattle of the wind creep into the music before you really know what's going on. Um, it's just, it's just, I just wrote like, it's the subtleties that you know what's coming maybe from the fourth wall, even if it isn't explicitly known yet. So it just, I, you know what I mean? You could kind of hear the trickle of the music of the sound of the wind coming in before it really flourished and before really Willie and Gish turned to see it. So I just thought that was um, good composing right there. I'm hoping that they may have seen the film prior to kind of do that, but for me that oh, was oh, like sure. mm, icing score, on the cake. Sure, yeah. I was like, oh, so good. <laughs> with this score, with this score by Carl, they for sure have had to do this. This is not something that you do. Uh, you make on it up fly. on the spot yeah. because they, uh, cool. they basically were showing this on the uh, TCM channel. So they mm-hmm. did a remaster, restoration of the original print, I think, and then also commissioned new music with uh, mm. Carl Davis and right. everything packaged up correctly. Yeah, I thought it worked. I really liked it. Yeah, and that stallion, I don't know what they represent. Uh, but... I, I thought it was, uh, according to that first article you sent us, it was it represented the Native Americans being displ- displaced, and that was their spirit. That's... One interpretation of it, but I think right, it, right. it's probably I don't sexual know. in nature in, in some ways because well, they said that too, yeah. Because I think it started. Um, when did it start? It started with uh, when she got off the train and she thought that the person picking her up was her cousin Beverly, right. but it turned out to be Liege, right, in, in Sardo. And so Liege, when he's it was either him or Sardo was describing the wind. That's when the imagery first uh, mm-hmm. started. Which, by yeah, the way, I liked has it. some ties to Phantom Carriage, which yes, yes. Jason also did. But, um, I saw that. What too, were you going to say? Yeah. Who? You, you, Adam, you were about to say something. Oh, interrupted. no, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, okay. I was just saying yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were going to say something else. Uh, no, no. But, yeah, that's – so I feel like, you know, when she mistook him for the cousin, there's – I feel like already – some sexual tensions there. And then as it subsequently shows up, I think it represents some of that. I also think that like towards the end when, uh, Roddy comes back. So the, the plot of the detail is that, uh, you know, they, they came upon somebody who is injured. So they bring the injured person. This is after, uh, uh, Legion, um, and, um, Roddy gets married. After they get married, Roddy goes to work and finds somebody and brings that somebody back. 
I'm sorry, the uh, leech, the husband. And then it turns out that person is Roddy, who's injured. And so they basically are like, because of hospitality or some weird law, reason or something, yeah. culturally, they, they're like, I got to take care of this person until they're well. And so the person ends up being Roddy, right? Which we know is that Roddy's just like the scoundrel who is married, but just trying to sleep with uh, mm-hmm. Letty. That's kind of his goal. Mm-hmm. So his uh, purpose is pretty apparent. Uh, but the fact that, you know, he's in their house now is, you know, yeah, it, it's very conflicted. Anyways, long story short, uh, uh, the husband, Leech, has to go somewhere else and invites Roddy to go along. So they all go out together and they ride in the horse. But then he s- stops and turns around and goes back, uh, Roddy does, to the house. And that, I think, specific scene, uh, again, where the silent shows up is where she's unconscious somehow and i think the story takes place is that the the connotation is that roddy rapes her i think in the right. story it takes a dark turn in, in, the, in the story in the novel he does and and then she she kills him stuff like that so that's about the same the only difference is that how it plays out is the husband doesn't come back and uh then she goes out to die that's kind of how it plays out with this film because this yeah i like the happy ending better yeah, I think <laughs> well, I do too. that's uh, a little too much well, it's not just that it's more like the way it's been set up the second half of the film was part of what the uh, movie silently uh-huh. review was talking about which was talking about but basically it's like you know you, you've built up this character who is on this trajectory and all of a sudden to, to, to kill her basically makes her one of those like you know once she's used up and raped then she has to kind of just be dead it's a sacrificial virgin type thing you know <laughs> there's a whole like theme behind that which is very common apparently so but anyways the point was uh this is pre-code so you can't really even show a lot of stuff it has to be totally implied right mm-hmm. but even above and beyond that i feel like there's this in the film there's a uh a, uh a, 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 i feel like there's a, a uh, a potential where that was imagined too, you know, whether she killed him or not. Because oh, okay. Roddy is a character that the other characters have interactions with. So we know he's real in terms of like, it's not imagined, right? So we, because otherwise everything would be imagined, you know, everything, right? Including the husband, including everything. But so you can't go there. But, uh, but if she imagined Roddy, then Roddy is like a real character, a real person. It's not like a fake imaginary person, right? Because he has interactions with everyone else, right? Well, the but, part that we weren't sure what she was imagining is after she buried him, whether he was being uncovered exactly, or not. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that is the gray area, you know. Did she imagine yeah. killing him, that part? Or did he just, cut, like, not even come to her house? Or what's the deal, you know? So that... Even the way he died was done well. You know, he just like, I can't believe he just did that. Yeah. <laughs> Was also kind of graphic in terms of uh, yeah yeah in in silent film era right is this pre code uh. but um, you know what that means right Adam pre code haze code oh yeah okay yeah good. yeah but I mean the late eight, oh yeah late twenties were when things are starting but they didn't really enforce it until nineteen thirty four that's when things started yeah. to take place well Barbara Stanwyck Barbara Stanwyck did a lot of pre code so right. yep I know it well yeah so 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 anyway so you know that's that's the plot part of the plot that's i guess interesting for for the character yeah. reasons yeah again it's uh compared to some of the other silence i've seen it was just a, a relief to see something done well like that right right what do you think of that uh lily i don't know if you read the articles but i'm just distilling some of the articles oh no i didn't get a chance to read the articles well I did, we just summarized it, was, it. Uh, well, i'm glad <laughs> yeah, really. i'm very glad because i still want to read them but yeah today was a very busy day for me and i was just like uh oh <laughs> you can send these great articles through the chat and i was just like oh i do not have time to read these that's all right but oh anyway so that's kind of the, the the details towards the end of the films but knowing that do you think it was an empowering film for women because you speak for all women, right? That's what we... That's what we <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. 20 years old and I know what's that's up. That's why you're on the um, podcast, right? <laughs> well, I guess we need a little bit of diversity. Sure thing. Whatever. I don't know. I'm um, kidding, by the way. Go ahead. I'm... Gl- well, cool. <laughs> um, oh, well, 
hearing how the story was supposed to go, uh, I'm glad the ending was changed. I mean, I will say, watching it, it is kind of sappy to have a happy ending, but it wasn't terrible. It wasn't what you want, but it's what you got. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you know, I can't really say that Lillian Gish's character really stood up. I mean, she stood up for herself at the very end because she wasn't going to take Roddy's crap. But I don't know. At the same time, I feel like a better ending would have been she would take Lige away with her somewhere else. I mean, even if the whole concept of the wind's supposed to be driving her to insanity and she can't take it anymore, but then that kind of disperses once Roddy's dead, I still feel like that presence is there, so why do you want to... Why would you want to stay in that same area with people that... Like he said, they don't want you there. So I feel like maybe it could have been rewritten in the script to... Like, they just travel off together. I feel like that would have been more satisfactory for me. Instead of them just, like, kissing in their front porch and the wind's blowing. And I was like, good for you. (laughs) I think the point might be that she's... Once Roddy, the character, and also the wind, represents her fears of the wind. And once her fear is dead and she says, I'm not afraid of it anymore, the wind isn't so much the thing that is driving her mad. It's her internal struggle. It's that her internal struggle is done and she's grown and she's no longer a dainty dame who's got to rely on other people for handouts. She's, it's, True. It, at least that's what the movie is trying to imply is that she's basically going to be like uh, Beverly's wife, a frontiers woman who was able to butcher steers if, if needed. Get whatever, you, yeah. you have to be whatever you need to be to get things done as a frontiers mm-hmm. woman, right? There's no like... It's a hard life. dainty about anything. You know, it's a totally different lifestyle. And the implication behind that is that her character has changed and embraced that lifestyle. Right? Mm -hmm. And so if they actually left that, then she would continue to be dainty and unchanged, as it were. I guess, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you always want change in your stories, especially for female roles, because it always seems to be lacking in that respect, because you don't want the female character to be one and done. Because usually she's used as a plot device, at least right. more commonly nowadays. It's which a lot of these, right? Yeah, and yep. it <laughs> just pisses people off, both yeah. you know, women and men, occasionally. <laughs> but uh, I would really have to do a deep dive and like think about a better answer for this question. Not on this podcast, if I would say, "Oh, you know, repressed. Oh, not so repressed." A little bit of both. I don't know. It's a little bit like Gone with the Wind a little bit. Mm-hmm. Kind of. But I feel like I have... Yeah, I haven't seen Gone with the Wind. I know how powerful that movie's supposed to be too, but I almost feel yeah. like... It's Letty's already. <laughs> I'm glad this wasn't. I already feel like Letty's already so much farther ahead than the other people in Gone with the Wind. Because I know they're like... It's Civil War era, right? Yeah. Right. So... Uh, I don't know. I almost feel like sh- Lillian Gish's character is in a better spot than the people in Gone with the Wind. Because I, I know of the movie, and I, I know it's a book, and I know how amazing it's supposed to be, and how um, critical it can be now. But it's like, do I know the characters? Not really. Would I add the list. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, my never running list. list. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I it's know. just, I was just thinking, like, Letty seems like a full character, and for the yep. people with Gone with the Wind, I couldn't tell you who the characters are. So that's just my two cents. People may disagree outside this podcast, and if you do, leave us a comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's my two cents. What? Um, any parting thoughts? I think that that's probably good enough for today, uh, unless you want to add something else. But any parting thoughts, last words? Uh, no, maybe? the music was my last one. Yeah. They enjoyed it or oh yeah, yeah. completely like Absolutely. i said the music to me makes it i hate it when they have a film and there's no music and you have to make up your own and it doesn't go and uh, yeah, yeah yeah just ruins it uh but i wondered how they um well i guess if the wind wasn't as bad as was in her head i was wondering how they grow like vegetables or fruit or any you know do they only eat meat 
Uh, I'm sure some history book. Lived. I'm sure some history book <laughs> in a, about the Dust Bowl would answer that. <laughs> yeah, I heard the Dust Bowl was uh, man-made, uh, as far as um, uh, the Grapes of Wrath. Oh, I don't know. Uh, that documented it was made by Ken Burns. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, it was. It was telling us that that was man-made, and uh, oh, I okay. never knew that. Wow. Yeah. All but right. That so, was the 30s. so uh, any other parting thoughts before we conclude today? And by the way, to your thing about music, Adam, the uh, I like the scene when they're in the dancing, the uh, the dance in the middle. Yep. And the music itself reflected whatever's going. The dance music. Like when they were going to the dance music, you'd have the violin. And... Oh, yeah, yeah. I think what really impressed me about that whole thing was this. Um, at the end, I think it said it was restored in 88. Right. Uh, I didn't realize it was going on that far back. I thought once things digitized, that's when it really got going. But the, yeah, Oh, they no, they've before. been restoring movies since the 30s, 40s, yeah. and 50s. I mean, think about it. If you were made a silent film in the teens or 20s, uh-huh. you need to restore a little bit of that for the thirties and forties. So they've been restoring movies since then, since forever. So, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just been paying attention to it the last 20 years. The, the best restorations is actually not digital, but rather, uh, physical because you, you have to like bathe the film print yeah. in chemicals. You have to do, I saw that handling. documentary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they made a special machine to handle it with, uh, the rubber or something or, some kind well, of material nowadays, that doesn't. But imagine not having any it. of those machines, and you're right. in the 30s and then 40s. Then you have to use the sprockets. Yeah, I don't even know what they did, but however they do it, they still had to uh, clean it up, restore it, and make it a clean yeah. print so that you can make copies off of the master print. You know. Well, I know Nosferatu. They said they had to um, wet it with oils just to get rid of the uh, some of the scratches. Uh, yeah. So I know they don't do that now. <laughs> All right, any other parting thoughts then? I'm good. I love this movie. <laughs> you like it? Uh-huh. Good. Well, I'm sure you can watch it again over and Yay! over. Yay! You should it watch again. The Scarlet Letter then. Oh yeah, my god, I saw... No, I hated that book. It was awful. I hate Nathaniel Hawthorne. I don't yeah, the, care what The American book was bad. It went on forever. <laughs> yeah. It went on forever. <laughs> yes. Well, those things were written as magazine installments. Yeah, I hate books that were written in the 1800s it was oh. actually that one might have been 1700s but still uh but this was um lily and gish uh about a year or two before that doing the scarlet letter with um you know the, the same people basically Even uh, the Victor, same director. yeah uh, yeah but also the same lead man lars hansen yeah, yeah. Hmm. and i guess greta garbo was always hanging around the set because uh, those two were together when she did that film yeah, well, who wasn't she with, right? So. <laughs> well, it was interesting because you could see Greta just taking Lars away from the camera. Come on, I'm come sure. on, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I saw that basically. I saw that first, and then I saw the wind right afterwards because they were both on Criterion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Criterion's a big one for me. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, my parting thoughts is that it, it definitely ranks as one of the classics. I, you know, I wish I had pursued the VHS copy long ago, uh, but I'm still glad I I've seen it today. Well, you know what this film really needs is a modern restoration, a remastering. Mm-hmm. I think it's still available just as a VHS, and the only DVD you can get is an import from like, I don't know, somewhere in Europe, Italy, wow. France, somewhere. I don't know. And the DVD itself was is still even just a, like basically a, a copy a or transfer. of the VHS. Yeah. So, yeah. like many films from these, you know, earlier eras, you know, especially ones that are even as great as this movie, they really deserve more attention. And mm-hmm. uh, hopefully, somebody somewhere is, uh, you know, going to spend some money to try to preserve this for just future generations, right? Because I'm sure right. uh, the print's sitting somewhere and hopefully it's not deteriorating. And, and, you know, there's a good print that you can still work off of and use and make a, a good, clean copy, you know. I hope so. hope so, too. So it's one of those film preservation things, you know. If nobody really pays attention, you know what? In another, you know, 10, 20 years, and if the ravages of time marches on, 
and we might lose some of these master prints, right? We'll only have really scrappy copies. The master there. prints, yeah. You know where they do find a lot of uh, lost films are um, those uh, 16 millimeters and sometimes 9.5 millimeters that were done for the uh, public. Right. Uh, sometimes that's their only copy to, to work with. Yeah, because you had a distributor like Blackhawk from Iowa right. making selling these prints that you can order, mail mm -hmm. order, a call and get an order of. Um, well, that's where Kevin, well, you know this, Kevin yeah. Brownlow discovered um, Napoleon through his 9.5. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. what they use in the UK is a 9.5. Yeah. But anyways, so yeah, that, that's our uh, take on the wind and uh, Lilinkish and uh, a bunch of people. And it's an amazing film. Highly recommend you have time to check it out. And uh, we'll uh, post some links in the in the show notes and go from there. So uh, thanks, listeners. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Lily. And uh, we'll uh, chat again next time. You can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilms, plural, .wordpress.com. You can send us an email, the same watchingsilentfilms at gmail.com. And please leave us a rating, a review. At Apple Podcasts or wherever you can find our podcasts. And thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, people. Thank you.